So I'm just going to do a quick warning at, at the start here for anyone who's you know actually really did study programming and knows the right terminology for things. Uh, you might want to just get another beer because there's a lot of conflation ahead. <laughs> so this presentation is really kind of a message to my past self. Maybe about 10 years ago, if I could get this message into my head, it would have been a really good thing. I would have uh, probably not wasted quite a lot of time. And I'm hoping that it's going to be useful to tell this tale because it may be familiar either to you directly or probably just as likely that you'll know someone uh, that you care about that is in that same sort of uh, state or mindset. And basically what happened was a few years back I had a complete oh shit moment. Oh, but yeah, this is going to be some fun. Sorry. And I just thought I could see my career options just sort of doing this kind of narrowing to nothing. And uh, I had a really challenging job. I had a great job doing development at scale, uh, as a front-end architect, had a team, all this kind of stuff, but uh, I, was, I was basically just doing HTML, CSS at increasingly large scale, only doing new stuff, just bigger. And although I could do a few things, like bits and bobs of JavaScript and some PHP, uh, like I could uh, but I just sort of thought that programming was for, like, for other, much smarter people than me. And uh, much like, sorry, I kind of expected at some point to find myself it's sort of ejected from the industry, sort of. You know, in this, the old Wild West movies where the cowboy gets thrown out the swinging doors and finds himself the script and what happened, you know. And uh, even though I sort of had all these, these thoughts going on, I basically like this image, I sort of sat there and stared at the problem for a long time. And, well, that doesn't actually help. So eventually, I made a move, and at the time, a whole lot of people were like, what the hell are you doing? Because it was seen as a bit of a sideways or possibly a bit of a backwards move. So I chucked in my job as, really, this slide deck trying to kill me. Okay, slick. All right. <laughs> so I resigned my job as a front-end architect, and I went and took a job as, uh, I had to look this up, a front-end developer brackets HTML slash CSS uh, in the software company. And I quickly discovered that front-end developer brackets HTML slash CSS <laughs> kind of in the pecking order rates around maybe the interns. But that's cool because... I was really, uh, for the first sort of, I don't know, maybe year or so, this is kind of how I felt. It was this huge learning curve. I suddenly found myself learning so much new stuff. I probably learned more in six months than I had in the previous two years. Uh, and I was trying to get my head around how to run up big Java apps and deal with all these different languages. And I was trying to learn uh, JavaScript from Dimitri and Jared, which is essentially, I think the technical term is drinking from the fire hose. And uh, the good thing is that it turns out working on software is awesome, and I really am so glad I made that change. But it was such a huge different range of skills. So it's like builds and tests and complex dev environments, all sorts of stuff. Uh, it's kind of interesting because it's a good thing I went and learned that because the web has actually become that since then. That's pretty much what a simple website looks like these days. But I still see people sitting in that HTML CSS niche for all the wrong reasons. And I kind of that's why I kind of felt I should talk about this. That uh, I remember what it was like to be hesitant to move outside. I think that everyone's going to be hard. But I think. It's not that surprising that we fall into this trap, because if you go back into the history of the web, it kind of makes sense. In the early days, if you were working on the web, it was all markup. Like, it really was all markup. There was nothing else. It was all inline everything, font tags, tables for layout as we went on, eventually went into like machine gifts and all kinds of terrible stuff. And if you were working on the web full time, uh, which was weird in itself, you might have been called an HTML developer, or maybe a web designer, or the dreaded webmaster. <laughs> and then CSS happened, and this was fantastic. Uh, and by the way, this is the entire first style sheet that I first encountered in my working life. Uh, this ran in the entire university website. <laughs> <laughs> well, the links, anyway. But this was groundbreaking because suddenly we could edit thousands, and the, the tens of thousands of documents use this thing. And what it meant was we could change all those documents without having to know regex or spend weeks on end manually editing things. And it really was the start of web devs starting to think at scale and be able to build very large things without actually you know, grinding to a halt. And it's funny to think about it now, but at the time of resistance, people didn't think this idea had legs. I don't know what they thought was going to happen, but CSS Zen Garden appeared just as a showcase of trying to convince people this is a good idea. And in May 2003, I think it had five designs when it launched, and some of them were very much at the time. But the point was really made that CSS made things flexible. You could repeat you could use your, uh, your basic uh, foundation build and reuse it. You didn't have to throw it against that again. 
which I'm sure to me more kind of wasn't as fun. And I, for one, did not welcome that for the script the Overlords because the JavaScript was just excruciating to write. It kind of it was so terribly inaccessible, it caused so many troubles, and it did really, really unspeakable things to the markup. And so it, as the, the ooze rolled on and the, the bomb with you know, the boom and bust happened the first time around and lots of stuff, so, this split came out of people who didn't want to deal with all that stuff. So we had the HTML CSS devs and the JavaScript devs, or things along those lines. It was the programmers and the front-enders, and this was this funny little split. But as evolution always takes hold and things push forward, things change. So this sort of explosion happened. And I remember this is a, a graphic I made in 2008, where I, this mind-blowing thing was going on at different strength sizes. Because until then, breakpoints would just would make things float at certain amounts, and they would break down a new line at a certain thing, because you had maybe three or four resolutions to support, and they're all about 100 pixels different anyway. Uh, and this is why we have like, many queries now, is that we're doing it anyway, just you know, banging lots together. And thankfully, JavaScript did improve as well. Uh, and a lot of the really big objections that I had uh, had sort of faded away. So ARIA came along so you could actually it could be used for good, not just evil. Uh, jQuery came along so it didn't have to bore you to absolute tears to write some JavaScript. And uh, as just things went on, it became more obvious that if you could do some CSS, you could probably pick up some of this. Because uh, jQuery made it really, really easy. If you could do a selector, you could then fire off, instead of just firing off styles at your group of uh, elements, you could fire off a JavaScript. And, elements. and this was a pretty easy job. And so you look at what happened with CSS and Garden over the, uh, it's been up nearly 11 years. And in uh, the early days, it was uh, absolutely best practice because it was fluid. So those two or three breakpoints, it stretched out and looked good. But you roll forward to now, and when it's coming up to its 10th birthday, if you looked at it on an iPhone, it was totally broken. This is about 500 pixels wide, where we started laying over each other and just breaking. So when it had to, uh, didn't have to, but they relaunched really for its 10th birthday with a nice modern new design, and of course, people just wanted it. And the poster child of CSS had, had actually uh, evolved to keep up with what the web had become. And in that same sort of time, where all of the front enders that have been doing it has changed so much that if you'd shown me what I do now back then, I don't think I'd have even recognized it as my own job. Because in those old days, things really were quite rudimentary. You know, in that first job where that star sheet came from, they, we, you know, import, it, CSS import was the height of the you know, we, we had no source control. Uh, we had a network drive and FTP, and, and we was grateful. And no version control meant that if you had to roll back, you had to go and ask someone to retrieve tapes from off-site. <laughs> you know, I sort of had this mental image, like, off-site? Look to that. <laughs> so if you look at then and now, the, the list of things that we were doing then and the list of things we were doing now, just to produce, basic site has just exploded. Uh, to do just a relatively simple site these days, um, you're probably handling a huge variety of tools and languages and certainly a whole lot of new uh, processes and techniques. And every single one of them's got their own quirks and challenges and all that stuff. And we've had to learn a great deal just to be doing more or less the same job. Uh, I will say I will go back. But it means that these days front engineers are really engineers. It's a subtle little shift in job titles, which job titles aren't the be all and end all, but they do have an indication. It's, to me, a sign that the line between front-end and back-end is essentially gone. The line between a front-end dev and a, a programmer is essentially gone. So, air yeah, quotes don't really come over to the that, so. so even if you still uh, focus on the markup and style, it's changed, just to get to that same result. And I don't think it's really fluffy to talk about this, because if you actually know what we now consider CSS, I mean, how many people here don't use a preprocessor of any kind ever? Is like one hand, everyone's pretty much using la like less or SAS or something, right? And if you're using that, essentially these things, these preprocessors, are more or less a programming language. They're usually based on one. And if you can use those, you're doing all kinds of things that pave the way to other languages. And native CSS, even just CSS, is getting more complex. You've got things like calc coming in, and when you think about the amount of different state uh, points you can be dealing with in, uh, just by Hoppers and, and all that kind of stuff, we actually understand state quite well, and we have breakpoints for understanding our environment. It's become really quite complex. And, and debatably, uh, against Rule 110, CSS is already trained quick. And so the CSS skills garden came, idea came up where I thought if you take the skill of CSS and then you look at it in a different light, you apply a different style, a different sort of thinking to your CSS skills, then you realize that in your overall skill set in your professional life, you have these big rocks. 
And they don't really move. Once you have them, they're there. And they are those specific languages and specific skills that you learn. And then all around it is this kind of malleable, conceptual, pattern-based knowledge that you can reuse over and over in new contexts. And I think we undervalue that a whole lot. To demonstrate just how literally true this can be, I only use SAS, by the way, because SAS, most of the, they do the same basic thing, so I'm hoping if you use most of them, you'll be able to see the concepts anyway. Um, but if you compare SAS and JavaScript, for instance, the current variable almost exactly the same. Like, there's a bar keyword, sure, but they are really the same thing. You're assigning a token that you can get a value from. And then as soon as you do that, you encounter types. And as soon as you understand types, you can have arguments with programmers all day. <laughs> because you understand the difference between a number and a string. Uh, colors, okay, they're not a JavaScript thing. But uh, you've got booleans and null, lists are just arrays, and maps are just objects. These are all very, very common uh, programming concepts. And functions is just the same as mixins. It's really just a repeatable set of code you can pass an argument to, and again, you can call it and get a result. And when you dig deeper into the SAS stuff, into the, the documentation, all those areas that lower down the page no one ever reads, SAS has basically lifted everything out of the math uh, methods of JavaScript. It's almost one to one. You can see very clearly where it came from. So if you actually use more advanced pieces of SAS, JavaScript can be really, really familiar. But okay, I mean, so that's all fairly primitive. So let's try something a bit harder. So scope. Now I'm gonna. I want you guys to have a look at this one. SAS obviously it has two scopes: so it's local and global. And does everyone want to guess what that uh, width is going to be at the end? We've got two variables that the width. Anyone want to have a guess what it's going to be? Ten. Ten. Correct. So it is ten because Sidebar can't access that local variable set in the, the main. Uh, that has block scope. So instead it goes up to the global variable set at the top. Easy, right? We've seen this in SAS all the time. We're really comfortable with that. We know what it does. Now, SAS can also do something which is just as bad as your JavaScript. And it can declare from a lower, a lower block, it can push something up into global scope. So if you want to guess what it is now, probably not what you're hoping for, right? Kill time. Oh, we've got a few people going, oh, not sure. <laughs> it's now five. Because even though something's coming from a completely un unexpected direction, it's been pushed into global scope. So here's that nice little caveat. You've learned lots of great stuff in SAS and CSS, but you've also learned some of the classic mistakes that are bad idea in both. So don't set a global variable in JavaScript either. JavaScript scope, I will say, is a little bit more complex than SAS. It's got a few more things you've got to worry about, hoisting enclosures and all that kind of stuff. Uh, it's worth looking these things up. But if you understand the basic idea of what scope is about, you kind of be okay. And uh, here's a little pro tip about going to JavaScript meetup since Pitch Shark is not here but hey. If you learn scope, closures, and hoisting, you will look smart with 87% of JavaScript meetup puzzle code. <laughs> Thanks to the Bureau of Meetup Stats. And uh, just because I've just turned into a self-fulfilling prophecy where I say that all meetups inevitably become JavaScript meetups, I'm going to say that it's not just JavaScript. I learned JavaScript and I thought that was the end of it. I thought I'd gone as far as I could go and I was back in that same old trap. And then I had this aha moment where someone actually taught me some typing. And it was the same. And I got my notes and I deleted all the content and then filled in the blanks. And I realized, holy crap, I've learned concepts. I actually understand the concepts. And you can see it. We go back to our variables and all through a whole bunch of different languages. It's basically the same. Some have keywords. Some are literally the same. Ruby and Python, you can declare them the same way. Now I know they're actually like slightly different things. If you understand the concept of one, you can understand the concept of the way through. And uh, it's the same with functions that will get you through from SAS. You can go to Python, you can start writing shell scripts, which is really, really great if you do a lot of stuff in the command line and you want to automate some. Because repeating yourself is really boring. I'd rather have like, write a script to go to Python. And dependency injection is really interesting. That this is a concept that some people find hard when they don't recognize what it is, but in SAS, you understand, if you're trying to use a variable that's not declared in this current file and you've forgotten to import it, it's not available to use. So you import it. You now basically understand dependency injection. It's a bit of compression, back and forth that. But it means if you understand the general concept, you'll be able to learn it in the next context. Or it's not even just languages, like I said. If you, uh, if you just want to keep doing HTML CSS and you want to be more effective with the tools you're dealing with to do that, just being able to uh, handle the command prompt, which you're going to be pushed into, learning that as a new skill and stepping out. I've seen a few people have found that very confusing because it is. It's essentially random. You can learn it quite quickly. But that's where your dependency management comes in, where you're trying to bring packages down and handle them. 
And again, it looks the same. You look at this, you've got London installed, you've got NPM installed, you've got Megan installed, go to lunch. <laughs> and I understand that it can be really, really hard to start because we look at all the things out there that we could learn and all the people that are already out there who are incredibly good at it and we think, there's just so much, it's overwhelming. And we all have these feelings like, oh my God, I'm never going to be able to do that or maybe I'm not as smart. And some of us have this problem with uh, you know, imposter syndrome and thinking that everyone else knows something we don't. And actually that is true, you know something they don't and that the collective knowledge is what makes teams great. And it's kind of funny, I think, that we have this terrible habit of, in IT, thinking everyone needs to be ninjas or gurus or rock stars or whatever, and we hold ourselves to this incredibly high standard. If we did that to everything in our life, it would be crazy. So, I'm a rock climber, not a good one. But if I applied that same thought, just because there's someone climbing mountains, I can sort of get up a 16 meter wall sometimes, but I should just stop. But that's crazy, right? It's better to actually take some inspiration. There's a tiny little dot, you probably can't even see at this resolution, and that's all we step. And he speed climbing the Argo, and he did it in uh, 2 hours 47 minutes. And he smashed an hour off that previous record. And the thing is, if you think about what we do on IT and we compare ourselves all the time, we think, well, he must have been comparing himself and trying to beat somebody else. It's like, well, no. Who was the previous record holder? He was. He held the previous record. And he, he can do shit about other people. He does now, but people broke the record. But at the time, he just thought he could do better. So he went out and he trained. And he trained amazingly. Look it up on YouTube. But he did this amazing thing, he got to the summit and thought, all right, well, what am I going to do next? He said, well, if I could climb a mountain and paraglide down, I could climb a mountain, I could climb three mountains in a day. This guy is crazy. The problem is he's a really terrible paraglider, so he had to go off and be a complete newbie. And YouTube has some great pratfalls. Like, this is him, he was meant to land in a field. This is him crash landing bum first into the car park, kind of near the field. Right? So nobody's a legend at everything right away. He did hundreds of practice flights before he became a proficient. So essentially what I'm saying here is, play your own game. You have a basis that you already have, and you can build on that to go and learn the next thing. You're already halfway there with your conceptual knowledge. And when you're setting out to learn something, don't worry about the needs. The people who are there before you that know ten times as much as you. It's like, if you can, learn from them. If you can't, take inspiration. But don't sit there and worry. I know too many friends who are like, I can never be as good as that. They can. If you spend the hours, you'll end up getting there. Or you might learn enough to get what you need to do. Now. So basically, my thought that I'll leave you with is if you step outside the sergeant, your skills, I believe, will serve you very well.